Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Mervyn Morgan. Uh, thank you for registering to take part in our paediatric um, ITP virtual meeting today. Uh, you can put your cameras on if you wish, not a problem. Um, just a quick change. Um, as we was due as advertised to have Dr. Nicola Cooper here today, but unfortunately Nicola has been a victim of what's going on a lot at the moment, which is um, airline changes to flights. Hmm. So uh, we're lucky enough to have Dr. John, John Granger here, one of our medical advisors. John is uh, a consultant haematologist at the Manchester Children's Hospital, and he also leads the uh, UK ITP paediatric registry. And I know John's going to say a few words about that at the start. So if you've got any questions, please, you know, feel free. I've actually got a few questions here already. And we've got more people coming in. I've got a few questions here already. But John, would you like to kick off? Just, you know, yeah, uh, no, that's introduce yourself first. And... That's great. Thank you very much, Mervyn. So, yes, I say my name's John, John Granger. I'm a paediatric haematologist based up in Manchester Children's. Um, and I've been involved with ITP care and ITP research now for about 25 years um, and a big part of that work has been the ITP registry which is fully funded and supported out of the ITP support association. Um, the registry really aims just to collect data on sort of children presenting with ITP to get an idea of numbers of children who have ongoing disease to look at treatment trends um, and to be able to extract information that hopefully is useful when we're sitting down with families and looking at some of the questions that have come through. Um, hopefully, you know, our experience from the registry will, will be helping with that. And yeah, at the moment we've got data from about 2,500 children over the years and virtually every centre in the UK is signed up, um, although COVID slowed everything down, um, centres are coming back on and supporting it. Um, I'm not going to say any, anything more really, but uh, other than again ongoing thanks for ITP support for keeping our ITP registry going and we couldn't do it without your ongoing work and support from there Mervyn and everybody else involved. Thank you very much John. Um, I know Maria's got some questions. Marie, would you like me to read them out for you or? Yeah, yeah, I guess a nod. Okay. Uh, I know you've got a copy of this, yes, uh, these, John. Uh, let's go for question number one. Our daughter is, was officially diagnosed with ITP in January 2021, age date, after a bone marrow biopsy. Oh. Her platelets were first found to be low in October 2020 when they were in the 70s. The lowest they have been to date is 22. After having COVID in October 2021, her platelets went up again to 300, which I've heard of before actually, but then dropped again within a couple of weeks, which I've also heard of, and then went up again in April 2022 after having a sickness bug. And then after having a sickness bug to 546, but dropped again within a couple of weeks. Over the course of the last year, our platelets have been stable around the 20s and 30s. We are still being guided to watch and wait with the hope that her body will recover itself without intervention of treatment. And we are told at this stage, there is still roughly a 65% chance of this happening. If we continue to watch and wait, at what point is it felt that it would be clear that things weren't going to rectify themselves without the intervention of treatment? Okay, so there's a couple of questions in there and a couple of sort of themes. First thing is sort of around how do we actually make a firm diagnosis of ITP? Um, people here will probably know we, we generally say ITP is a diagnosis of exclusion, i.e. we're wanting to make sure that we're not missing any other significant cause of low plate that's in, in sort of the paediatric section. The most common thing we see mimicking as ITP is what we call bone marrow failure uh, instead of the, so in ITP the bone marrow is kicking out plenty of platelets and then they're being consumed in the circulation by the immune system 
in, in bone marrow failure, the body's not producing them properly. So we tend to do a bone marrow to exclude bone marrow failure in those children who have sort of ongoing low counts, especially in those who don't respond to sort of previous therapies. If you responded to ITP treatments, then that pretty much helps confirm it's ITP. Um, and other things that make us worry about bone marrow failure would be when there's a less clear cut history of ITP sort of presenting suddenly after a viral infection, or if any of the other blood counts will be off. Um, the bone marrow doesn't necessarily make the diagnosis of ITP, but it does exclude the bone marrow failure. Uh, other things that can mimic ITP can be sort of congenital plate that problems. So some people, for some reason, their body just doesn't produce as many plate that's, um, and that can often run in families. And in those circumstances, we often do sort of genetic testing to make sure that we're not missing a diagnosis there. Um, the, the next question is around watch and wait. So in the first sort of three months when ITP is first being sort of diagnosed, we expect about half of the people to spontaneously get better without treatment, um, about sort of 80% by about six months uh, and about 90% by one year. Um, and is this term chronic ITP that we tend to use once ITP has been going on for more than a year, which basically means at that stage, the ITP is more likely to stick around than not. So when, once you've gone past the six month mark, the chance of the ITP going away on its own in the next six months is about 25%. And then once it's been going on for a year, the chance is about 10 to 20% each year of it going away spontaneously without treatment. Um, so we we don't tend to sort of support a management plan of watch and wait once it's been going on for more than a year, because I guess part of the question is what we're waiting for. Um, but then if we are offering treatment, it's a weighing up of the burden of the treatment, the possible side effects of the treatment, and then the benefits. In somebody who's running a plate that counts over 20 and, and certainly somebody who was running a plate that count over 30 to 50. Um, the question then would be how much are they actually having problems with bleeding and if they're not having significant problems with bleeding and I know we're going to come on to the fatigue bit in a minute but from a bleeding aspect if someone's plate that's over 20 that they're at exceedingly low risk of any dangerous bleed but if they're having ongoing bleeding that's causing bother, causing worries, interfering with lifestyle, etc., then we would often think about treatment there. The actual licensing that allows us to get our hands on some of these drugs tends to be a plate that count of under 30 or somebody with significant impact on quality of life, which could be bleeding or fatigue. I'm not sure if that answers you first bits. Marie, did Marie, that help with the first question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. So, right, question two. Um, her daughter has always complained of feeling tired, fatigue. She's very emotional and complains a lot about aches and pains in her joints and headaches. On both occasions when her platelets have gone up after the viruses, all of this has gone away. In addition, her appetite went through the roof and she was absolutely full of fun, energy and confidence. She was like a completely different child on both occasions of her platelets increasing. I am, however, told constantly that none of these are symptoms related to ITP. I don't know who tells you that, Marie, but uh, I think uh, fatigue was the number one issue with patients in the I Wish survey a couple of years ago. John, do you want to touch on that? Yeah, I think it, it's certainly something that every haematologist recognised in adult patients and when we, we did our quality of life work where we were asking the children, do you feel more tired than usual? Um, eight out of 10 of them would you know, give the response that yes, they were feeling significantly more tired. It tends to be more, more obvious at the beginning of the disease and whether that's just that the children adapt and cope with it better when it's going on but it certainly can wax and wane and very, very much it is a feature of ITP. 
Um, the slight challenge is it doesn't always improve with ITP treatment, although some people do find it improves with ITP treatment. Um, but if it's causing a real impact, especially on schooling um, or just general life at home, because any tired child can be a <laughs> very difficult child sometimes, um, then it's often worthwhile a, a course of treatment to see if it does improve or not. The fact that it tends to, this is suggesting that with viral infections and when the platelets have gone up and normalised that it's improved, that would tend to make you think that it is a good likelihood that some treatment would help. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Lindsay, you've got your hand up. Yeah, um, just quickly, um, my son was actually diagnosed with ITP literally only five weeks ago. Um, he was um, complaining of just feeling generally unwell couldn't really explain his symptoms. Um, I put it down to the extreme heat that we was having at first. Um, so I took him to A&E initially because I wasn't happy with the way that he was coming across. Um, his urine was very dark and foamy um, and they put it down to him being dehydrated at first. Um, so after that day, he wasn't really getting any better and his urine was still quite dark and foamy and I contacted my GP explained his symptoms which actually also included very itchy skin um, so they run a set of blood tests uh, to rule out any sort of thing wrong with his liver and kidneys um, but also glandular fever um, a few hours after the test was done, we got a, a, a phone call to say that he has tested positive for glandular fever and his platelet level was only seven. So at this point, we was advised to rush him into A&E where they then examined him, um, read his like, history and stuff like that. Um, and then they diagnosed him with the ITP. They said the glandular fever would have um, would be the main cause of him contracting the ITP. Even though it's only been five weeks, um, we've been in and out of hospital a few times. His platelet levels have got as low as two. He's had one course of IVIG, um, which he didn't really respond to. They only increased to six. So they said the same thing. We'll watch and wait, send you home and we'll will continue with weekly blood tests. Each time he went for a blood test, his platelets would drop more or less straight away. So the next day that we had in hospital was about three weeks ago, where they um, examined him because he was complaining of quite bad stomach pain. And I've heard that the spleen and the liver is often quite affected with glandular fever, but also with the ITP. Um, he had an ultrasound scan and they've said that it showed some mild um, fatty changes to his liver and uh, his spleen was mildly enlarged but they wasn't concerned so they then put him on a four-day course of steroids which bumped his levels up to 42 so they said we'll leave him a month now instead of bringing him in giving him weekly blood tests we'll leave it a month but literally within a few days today I had to take him to A&E because he came up with all the rashes again and they've now gone back down to six I know that some children have had this condition for quite some time, but I, as a parent, I'm quite concerned that each treatment that he's having, his, his platelets are dropping rapidly and the fatigue side of things seems to be getting worse. And I don't know, his, his bloods are all coming back fine. So his red cells, his white cells, everything in his full blood count is absolutely fine, apart from his platelets. Is there a chance, I know it's only been a few weeks, but is there a chance that he could still recover from this? Sorry, Lindsay, how old is he again? He's 14, he's 15 on Saturday. Okay. So, you know, certainly the glandular fever or any significant viral infection can sort of trigger off the ITP. And what's happening is sometimes there's a bit of protein overlap between a virus and the plate that, and then the body's thinking that the plate that's is still part of that infection that's going around. So the body's continuing to fight the plate that's leading to the ITP, even sometimes after the glandular fever bug has cleared. Um, obviously, as you know, with any significant bowel infection, it can take a number of weeks for it to go away. And that tends to be the time when 
most children, you start to see the plate that's going up. But in some people, the body still thinks the infection's around and the plate that stay down. But yeah, I would always quote in the first three months, 50% of people will get better quickly, um, yeah. especially when there's a clear viral driver. So there's a very good chance of things settling down. Okay. And when we give treatments, whether that's immunoglobulin or, or whether it's the steroids, that doesn't alter the long-term likelihood of the ITP clearing away. And we've done studies where we've given half the kids immunoglobulin and half watch and monitor, and then looked at what's going on in a year's time. And there's absolutely no difference at all. Yeah. What the immunoglobulin and the steroids are aimed at doing is to try and dampen down that immune attack on the plate that's spare the plate that's and allow them to go up to switch off bleeding. So, you know, we may have a child who's got a plate that count of one or even less than one on the analyzer who only has the bruising and the pinprick rash, and no active bleeding and not give any treatment at all. And yeah. that's when we tend to call yeah. it watch and wait because we're waiting for that spontaneous recovery. Mm -hmm. And then we're just holding the treatment back for when there is actually a bleeding event. Uh, and it's a, a safe approach, very safe approach. As, as long as parents know what to look out for and you've got good access to the medical care to get that treatment in. Um, the fact it doesn't respond to immunoglobulin is a little bit disappointing. Um, I'm not sure what sort of dose of steroids they gave him, but guessing they may have just given him one milligram per kilogram sort of dose. The steroid dosage that he actually had was um, uh, 200, um, 200, oh God, 200 milligrams per day for four days. Okay, so they did, you, and, and I'm assuming it's about 60 kilograms, that's a quick guess. Yeah, I'm not too sure actually. All I know is that it was quite a high dosage. They gave him a omeprazole as well to try and yeah. keep his stomach from bloating. Um, yeah, so he actually had, he had a reasonable dose and he's probably yeah. had what I call a four by four regimen. Um, and yeah, he's, he sort of had a in, in between response, you know, getting the plate that's up over the 30 generally will help switch off bleeding, but it's it's not a fantastic response. No. Um, no. But yeah, you know, most likely that as his body clears the glandular fever and they may want to just do some more testing to see what's happening to that glandular fever because you can monitor the virus quite clearly and right. then as the glandular fever clears hopefully he, he will you know his counts will come up and recover and if they're not then that's the time when we start thinking about some of the the newer treatments that can be used longer term and have very few side effects right okay lovely thank you uh, does that help Lindsay? I know, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, when we had the phone call, you know, the, the sort of telephone discussion earlier in the week, yeah. he was, you know, really worried about the lad. So, To be honest, it, it's just getting an understanding of um, the condition itself. I mean, the medical team that I've been dealing with have all been very thorough and very good with George, but I get different answers each time we get a different consultant in regards to the watch and weigh, only bring him in if he's got a visible bleed, i.e. from when he goes to the toilet or from his nose, from his gums, anything that he's not, um, well, that we're not able to stop within 30 minutes. But then when I see a different consultant, bring him in if he's got any new bruises, any new pinpricks. So I'm continuously watching him for any new symptoms and it's becoming really distressing. Like mm -hmm. today, we was in A&E for six hours for us to be told that his platelets have gone from 42 down to six. And because there's no visible bleed, they sent us home. So it is distressing. I can understand that they don't want to keep pumping them full of drugs because obviously it can be more, um, more damaging than anything else. But as a parent, it, we've, we're finding it hard to lead a normal life. I know, I know. Uh, I also know Liz has posted off to you all, all the booklets, yeah. etc., and all that. So, yeah. So if, if you haven't got them, you should get them tomorrow. So, Thank yeah. Okay. Thank That's you. Yeah. And then just, <laughs> let me just sort of come back into that. You know, at, at the beginning, we tend to monitor the plate that count quite carefully. In, in reality, what we're mainly monitoring is the rest of the blood count 
just to make sure that none of the other cell lines are dropping down that would get us worried about this bone marrow failure I've been talking about um, or another sort of cause of low blood. So that's the main benefit of doing the early checks. And then obviously the other benefit is trying to be able to touch base with the families and provide the education, provide support to make sure that he's back in school and he knows what he can and can't be doing, which yeah. uh, with a 15 year old is always slightly challenging because you've got to put some degree of level trust and responsibility on his shoulders there. Um, yeah. And then you again, you've got to think which of the circumstances are we going to give him more treatment? And it really would be if he was having active bleeding. So our, our local policy would tend to be, obviously, if there's ever any blood in the poo, any blood in the wee, any significant head bump, um, or if you have something like a nosebleed that's gone on more than a 15 minutes, those would tend to be our thresholds for giving some medicine. Um, yeah. And obviously if he's yeah. responded partially to the steroids in the past, he would end up with another short course of steroids. But if you give steroids more than a couple of weeks, you run the risk of introducing diabetes, increasing risks of infection, um, strength of bones. You know, there's a million and one problems with long term steroids that we really, really wouldn't want to be exposing him to and potentially much more risk of coming to damage from the steroids than probably from the ITP. Right. OK. And um, just one more question. When you say, obviously, I know that when they do the blood tests each time this they're, they're still looking out for other markers that could um you know deteriorate and stuff like that once a child or a person has been diagnosed with itp is there a chance that there could be anything underlying causing the itp other than a viral infection because my main concern with the platelet level was things like leukemia yeah so obviously when you've got leukemia first thing you've usually got you know, you expect your child to usually be quite unwell. You've usually got high fevers. You will often have lots of lymph glands up. You won't have just a tiny bit increase in the spleen. You usually have a massively increased spleen. And you would expect all of the bloods to be down because if you've got leukemia in the bone marrow, it's not just suppressing the platelets, it's, it's suppressing everything else. Um, and of course, one of the things which we do as haematologists is when we initially get that first count, it's not just running it through the analyzer, we actually look at the blood under the microscope and would expect to see leukemia cells if they're circulating there. Um, very occasionally you can get a, 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 you know, a low plate that counts in isolation, that's, you know, a week later other cells all drop down, but not four or five weeks down the line and not in somebody who's had a response to steroids. Right. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you. Before I go to the next question that I've had in, is there anyone else wants to come in with a question? Yeah, Roberts. You're muted at the moment, sir. Hello. Um, Hello. So a uh, 15 year old daughter was diagnosed back in March um, after a long nosebleed. Um, She's been back and forward, um, keeps getting those meets in hospital, see, um, going to see an ENT for the second time uh, in a couple of weeks about whether they cauterize or not. The first one didn't want to cauterize the nose. Uh, this is a question I suppose in two parts. Is that is that advised to do something like that? And then the second question is a bit more, um, just to understand, I understand that ITB is obviously an, um, an autoimmune thing. He also has... Um, an underactive thyroid which is autoimmune um, and I was questioning whether or not we need to look out for other autoimmune things does this mean that she's more susceptible to get autoimmune conditions because she's got two already okay so first question sort of around the nosebleeds and the management of such um what we tend to see is it in some children, especially those who are more prone to nosebleeds before the ITP was diagnosed, then the nosebleeds can be quite an ongoing issue. Um, we tend to look at ways of protecting the nose in those children, i.e. making sure they, they drink plenty and most of the nosebleeds usually come on either after a bout of hot weather where the nose has dried out, when the heating's coming on, which again is drying things out, 
or after infection when the nose is more naturally engorged. Um, so other than drinking, we tend to sort of recommend having a little pot of Vaseline, smearing some Vaseline on the fingers and then just on the outside of the nose. And that again, just helps stopping the nose dry out. If they've seen our ENT, they probably would have also tried an antibiotic cream, just because again, sometimes, especially with younger children, fingers up nose can introduce some infection there. Um, and then that helps clear out the infection. With regards to the actual nasal cautery, what the aim there is, is to put a sort of stick on an actual bleeding point. So if there's quite clearly a very enlarged blood vessel or at the time shortly after a nosebleed, they can see an ongoing leaky blood vessel, then that's beneficial. If they can't see anything, then it, they can't cauterize because it's, it's random trying to decide where to put it. The one problem that we certainly do see sometimes with cauterizations is where you actually do sort of the cauterization, you then get a rim around where the nose thins out. And sometimes that can then become a bleeding point. Um, I don't worry about one or two cauterizations, but I've come across some children who have ended up having five or seven where it's literally just starting to bleed from somewhere else. I've actually had one child where they managed to burn all the way through the nose because they've done so many cauterizations. Um, but one or two, I think, is fine if there's a clear bleeding point. Um, and then, you know, again, if we are seeing nosebleeds that are going on sort of longer than 20 minutes, that would usually be an indication for giving some plate that rise in treatment. You know, especially in somebody who's not particularly prone to nosebleeds because it's sort of suggesting that they're more at risk of bleeding and could be more at risk of bleeding from other places. She was, she was prone to nosebleeds before. She's yeah. now, she's now on the injection. Um, um, yeah. Um, yeah. And her platelets having been down to two and four are up around 60, but she's still getting nosebleeds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and again, we, we we do see that. We generally say that a platelet count of over 50, the body's functioning normal. Um, so you know, when they were over 50, it's probably a case that it was always going to be having that nosebleed, whatever, but we'd probably just be more aware of it because of the ITP. And when the counts are lower, again, I suspect it's not the ITP that's necessarily causing the nosebleeds in her if she was more prone, but it's certainly making them heavier and a bit more dramatic and increase in your worry. Okay. Um, your second part of the question around sort of the immune disorders, again this is where the ITP registry comes in really useful because when we look at people who have a history of autoimmune disease, um, I think there was a question about celiac on Lindsay's paper, um, we, we do see a higher incidence of ITP um, and it's you know we generally say ITP is not a genetic condition, but quite clearly some people have got to have some sort of predisposition to get it. Otherwise, why do some people get it and why do some people not? And I think that the, the more work which we're doing around genomics, et cetera, is suggesting that some people are more prone to autoimmune diseases. Um, I've certainly had a couple of patients with thyroid problems, I've had a couple of patients with diabetes, I've had many patients with gut problems, um, which is linked into the ITP. Yes, it probably does increase the likelihood of me screening them for other autoimmune problems, um, and probably repeating that screening on a, on a yearly basis, especially looking for lupus. Um, but whether it actually really increases the likelihood of further autoimmune problems, I think the answer to that is probably yes, but over probably a whole lifetime rather than over the next few months. Okay, I mean, so the so we should get her screened for other autoimmune disorders, is what you're saying? I think if she hasn't had at le least a sort of screen, so I would do what I call an anti-nuclear antibody, which is a rheumatology screen, um, a double-stranded DNA, which is specifically for lupus. And I think our other screens would largely be driven by if she was having other symptoms, such as joint swelling, um, if she was having gut problems, you know, they would be driven by those symptoms, really. Okay.
there is a she does have a well we have another gene disorder and i don't know if it's probably not connected at all but we're susceptible to malignant hypothermia and which in the family so i've no um, idea I'm, I'm aware of the condition but i've never come across that linked with itp yeah. um but it would certainly get an anaesthetist a little bit nervous i know yeah. when she had a bone when she had a, a biopsy it did yeah <laughs> Attracts attention, definitely. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, the lady with iPad is the name, with her hand up. I don't know your name, my love, so, yeah, sorry. I can't hear you. No, still can't not, hear you. You're not on oh. mute, but your microphone's not coming through at the moment. Is that better? That's better, yeah. that's better. Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah my name's Charlotte Jackson. Um, I have a, a son who is uh, three and a half. Uh, he was diagnosed when he was just over two um, and his levels at that time uh, were zero. Um, he was then given uh, the IVIG um, pro about two months in um, and um, that was relatively successful short term. He dipped again and then um, uh, went back up to normal um, for th three months. And the doctor said, right, this is a, a good result. We're going to stop testing and we're going to say he's recovered. Um, uh, so there were no signs of anything then for the next, um, let's say eight months or so. Uh, and then in August this year, I could, we could see um, uh, some signs coming back. He'd had a virus. Um, and then uh, two weeks later, uh, I could see the uh, spots and bruises. And indeed, it had come back and his levels had dropped to 10. Um, um, he's had another set of IVIG. Uh, he has very bad um, 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 uh, result. Um, he had good results, but uh, there was a, he had a very bad reaction to it. Um, and now we see uh, he's on around uh, 60. Um, would you call this now chronic or is it still acute? Um, could you, uh, do you have any sort of insights into um, a child of this age growing out of it? Um, possibly, um, obviously a, a child of uh, three and a half is very difficult to uh, explain things to. Um, uh, especially in terms of running around and jumping on trampolines and that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I, I, I know your pain and, and challenge, Lair. Um, yeah. You know, we would probably define this as a second incident episode of ITP. Um, the, the immunoglobulin, you can see a response lasting up to about sort of three months, occasionally up to four months. Um, I tend to, for our children who I look after who have had immunoglobulin I would usually follow them up until sort of three months after it and then would probably then do, throw in another count for good measure another three months after that before I said it had categorically gone away um, and I would be classifying a, a number of over 150 as being normal. Um, we then see about one in 20 children have a second episode um, and that second episode can behave similar to the first one, or if the first one was long, the second one can be short, or if the second one, sorry, the first one was short, the second one can be long. So it, it behaves really as a totally new episode of ITP, and there is no good predictors of how that is going to behave. So all that can really quote you would be, you know, those same standard figures that you heard me saying at the beginning. So that 50% will be better at three months, 70 to 80% at six months, and 90% at one year. And I don't think the first course of it has any bearing on it at, at all. If he's running numbers at around the 60 mark at the moment, it, then it, his body is functionally normal. But obviously, if he's had immunoglobulin within the last three months, then obviously still there's that possibility that it could drop down again. If he had immunoglobulin and also had, sometimes we get tend to give steroids alongside immunoglobulin, not to boost the platelets, but to try and reduce that 
immunoglobulin reaction, especially the headache and the fevers. Um, and if he had the steroids alongside the immunoglobulin, but still got all of that, then obviously we would be quite nervous of giving him immunoglobulin again, as I'm sure you probably would be. Um, um, but you know, no steroids, no. Yeah, so yeah, so you you, they, you could give him immunoglobulin again if he was actually bleeding um, to switch off a potentially dangerous bleeding episode, but would give steroids alongside it. And that would probably prevent that sort of reaction that you saw. And about 20% of people will get some sort of immunoglobulin reaction. And again, that's one of the reasons in the first place that we try and hold it back for those people who are having bleeding where we really need to switch, you know, bring the count up. Yeah. OK, um, thank you. Um, I have an, just one other question. Um, I struggle a bit with um, um, where, with the kind of limitations on the levels. Um, and our doctor says um, he should lead a normal life as much as possible, which of course I totally agree with. Um, but there also is also um, uh, a parental uh, um, worry as well, especially he goes to nursery. Um, when his levels are under 10, I am very, nervous to send him to nursery. I also uh, um, don't think it's right for the nursery to take that responsibility either, but that's just me. Um, how, how do you see it or do you see it really as a personal uh, thing? So I think the first thing is very quickly, most families become an expert in knowing where their child's plate, the count is running at. You know, when the plate is okay. over 50, you probably won't even be seeing any lumpy bruises or anything at all. When they're in that 20 to 50 mark, you'll see more lumpy bruises. When they're below 10, certainly you'll be seeing all of the pinprick rash. So without a, a need for a blood count machine, which is going to cause trauma, not really give you any extra information, you know where they are at. With regards to nursery, that's entirely a family decision. Uh, it depends obviously on, you know, your work-life balance. You know, obviously trying to get children into nursery is great for their social development and it's great for us parents to give us a little bit of a breather, allow us to work and all of that. Um, but if it's causing massive anxiety, then it, it is quite difficult. Obviously, ITP support do produce some great leaflets for nurseries. Most of your, most of the hospitals will be more than happy to touch base with the nursery and go through what they can and can't do when they need to worry, when they need to call you, which actually in reality is not going to be different to any other child because any child who gets a slight bit of a bump, they, they should be calling the parent about it anyway. But it might just reassure them and that might help to reassure you. Um, with regards to activities in these in the younger children, you basically can't stop stop them really. I think it activities here, I think in a sort of three, four year old is very different to a 15 year old who's got lots of weight behind them, is playing with big heavy kids, and where sports and activities are taken much more seriously. Uh, personally, I I don't tend to sort of put restrictions necessarily on the children, but just try and encourage. The families to have a degree of common sense that if it's looking a bit wild get them out of that ball pit or if it's looking calmer then it's fine to do so I don't think there is hard and fast rules you've just got to assess the situation when it when it's there um, and hopefully it is relatively short-lived and things will settle down quickly you know in the old days before we started running our ITP clinics I was sometimes seeing older children who were told that they couldn't even be in school until the platelets were normal and we we're saying well it could be a year you know you just mm. don't know you've just got to be able to get on with things as near normal as you can um, obviously there'll be nothing that will completely take that worry away but I think as you get more experience with how the ITP is affecting your child what bleeding they're getting and what they're not getting you will quickly become an expert in what they can and can't do and when they can can and can't do things. Okay, so yeah. help. Yeah. Yeah, thank uh, you very much. Uh, there you. is a school information pack you can download from our website. 
you know, the, the uh, uh, leaflet that uh, John was talking about. Okay. Yeah. Right, Great. Thank you very hands much. Up. No problem at all. You've got two pairs of hands up. Uh, first one up, Marta. Do you want to put your camera on so we can? And you're, you're actually muted. No. Ah. Uh, you're still muted, Marta. While you're sorting that out, I'll go to Andrew, right? Okay. Andrew, you put your camera on. That's it. Hi there. Um, oh, you're not Andrew. Sorry. No, sorry. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. We have a three-year-old little girl who got diagnosed in August. Um, her platelets were 19 when she went in. Within two weeks, they were up at 119. And then we were back in clinic um, at the beginning of September and she dropped down again to 46. Um, looking at her at the moment, I think her platelets are kind of okay but she's back in clinic in the beginning of October, so we'll see what they are. But our thing is at the moment, we're a bit worried obviously going into the winter. Do we need to be kind of a lot more aware of her picking up? You know, I'm, it's gonna be an awful winter with coughs and colds and viruses and stuff. Do we need to be a lot you know, more cautious of her picking up these viruses and that dropping her platelets again? So there's two aspects to that. So our normal response to a viral infection is actually our platelets normally go up as part of the inflammatory response to an infection. And that probably happens still in, in about half of the children with ITP. Um, in the other ones who are just in the recovery phase, it can, it can sort of boost the immune system to cause the platelets to drop down. My experience is usually when they get sort of these sort of coughs, colds, there can be a drop, but it's usually a relatively short lived drop. And then it usually goes back down back to where the baseline is. There's the other huge practical aspects of how on earth is it possible yeah. to shield yeah. a child against a viral infection? Um, assuming these, you know, what one of you is out at work or has got others other brothers or sisters who may be in and out of school, viruses are going to come through. All you can do, I think, is encourage, you know, the hand washing, covering of the mouth. Um, I tend to, there's a big debate about things like the flu vaccine, um, especially in the younger children when there may not be as much risk of them from flu, but it's merely protecting the pop wider population. In our children with more chronic ITP, where things have recovered or where things have settled out, I would usually suggest that if they were going to be having the flu vaccine, go ahead with it. If it's a child in the early sort of three months where the platelets are just starting to go up, I would usually say maybe just hold off a little bit to see if the platelets can come up and settle down yeah. well, rather was. than challenging them. She was due her preschool boosters, um, but we yeah. not we're not giving those at the moment. Is that what you would advise as well? Yeah, I think very much. I think it, you know, if she was just diagnosed, you know, last month, I yeah, would probably yeah. just be holding off because obviously the preschool ones have got a few live viruses yeah. there, um, and they're more likely to dip it down. I wouldn't say hold off forever. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in a child who's got chronic ITP, who's played the sustained persistently down, let's say at 10, um, we would go on because what's the harm in it? Yeah. And if the platelets have recovered or plateaued out, then we'll usually go. But just while we're in this initial, hopefully recovery phase, I wouldn't want to necessarily sort of challenge the immune system if there's an option just for delaying things. Um, but from the school and picking up viruses, there's absolutely nothing you're going to be able to do to avoid them, I'm afraid. No. And the only other thing is our kind of criteria for once she's, fingers crossed, soon stabilised, is once she has two counts above 150, then she kind of gets discharged. But would you say that she needs kind of a further follow up, like listening to other people, it sounds like a few of them have then had further episodes of it. So is this something so, uh, to keep looking out for in the future, really? 
Um, so yeah, you, we would usually say it, it had cleared when you've been more than three months away from any recent treatment and with sort of two normal plate that counts at, at least sort of four weeks-ish apart from each other because you can often get duff counts. Yeah. Um, so, and then I would usually say it's gone and I would then quote, as I said, about a one in 20 chance of a second episode. And most parents having lived through this once are experts on picking yeah. it up yeah. quite quickly. So our, our normal practice would be to say, if you ever worried, just phone in and we'll get a blood count check through the hospital because it's a lot quicker than going through yeah. the GPs. But that obviously has to be negotiated with your haematologist as to what they're happy to offer and what they can't. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Now, Marta's back. Can you unmute now, Marta? Or... Yes, I've got a problem. Hello, right. everyone. So Marta next and then Rachel, OK? Go yeah, on, so my son, um, he's 10 years old now. He's been diagnosed in 2018. So it's qu quite a long time, four and a half years. And we, I think we go through all the steps in a Royal Host Hospital in a Whitechapel in London. And now he's got um, infusion uh, calling rituximab. Yeah. And we're going tomorrow for the last one uh, and my question is that this is gonna help him or not because i'm losing my hoping with everything last week after three times it's been two again so it's my hope it's like i can't understand this illness you know for me it's so difficult to understand one week is five then two then zero and the maximum, it's like 10, 12. I, I really don't understand how to um, get better with, with him, you know? Okay, so the treatments we tend to consider when somebody has had ITP going on more than six months, and certainly once it's been going on for more than a year and having a persistent low count below the 30 mark or significant problems, we would think about most commonly what, we call it the TPO mimetic. So that would be l Trompapag, which is the tablets. Um, oh, we've got a, already. Sorry, yeah. we have No, already. just going, going through work. everything for everybody yeah. else's benefit as well. Um, there's another similar one to l Trompapag by mouth that's called Ava Trompapag, and then is the Wimiplastim injection. So we probably would try with... I've with got the Remoprostin. Uh, sorry, sorry to the start, because, you know, I don't tell you as well. We've got injection as well, you know. I give him every Tuesday and then we have steroids and we have this infusion. So all, all free, yeah. let, let's say it's not, not helping, you know, I just yeah, losing then, my hope. And then, yes, we talked about this probably what we would try next after Lowe's. Um, and with all of these medicines, I always say ITP is really frustrating because you know, obviously a lot of the public know about haemophilia, but actually if somebody comes with haemophilia, you can bang in a treatment and be 100% certain they're going to respond to it within five minutes. With virtually all the ITP treatments, you can only give percentages of response rates. You know, the TPOs, I would generally quote about a 60% chance of response. And then this rituximab, yes, there's four infusions a week apart, um, some of us right. use some steroids alongside the rituximab, some people don't. Um, the success rate with rituximab, I usually break it into a rule of thirds in so much that about two thirds of people tend to respond at some point, And that response can take up to six weeks after the last infusion. So okay. it, it can take a little while to see the response. And then of those people who do get a response, um, about half of them will sustain that response for over a year and half of them will lose that response quite quickly. Um, we can have various predictors. Um, adolescent girls in particular seem to be more prone to responding to it compared to sort of boys and uh, add older children are more likely to respond to it to younger children. Um, but generally, a third don't respond at all, a third get a transient response, and a third get a long-term response. Um, so I think that's 
all, all I can say, and I, and I have seen several children who haven't had any response during the initial three, and you do have to just wait for at least six weeks after the last one before you would then say that somebody hasn't responded. And then, uh, and then it's a case of once you've tried lows, always go back to the basics. Is he bleeding? How much of a bother is the ITP really being? Or do we need to then think about other treatments after that? And the other treatments, which generally, if we are struggling, would be still going back and, you know, obviously we don't do many splenectomies, but we would think about splenectomy. We would also think about some of the clinical trials. So we have got a number of new drugs coming through. Um, for an older child is one called Rilzabrutinib. I know it doesn't roll off the tongue, but I'll put it in the chat uh, so you can see the name of it. Um, that's another one that we're looking at and in adults who have been refractory to about everything, three out of five of them seem to respond to that. But again, it's not a hundred percent response. Um, the other thing which we would be doing in somebody who hasn't really responded well to treatments is again, just going back to the basics and asking, the question, are we sure it's ITP? Obviously, if he has responded to immunoglobulin or steroids in the past, that reassures you. If he's never responded to anything, um, we would want to think about doing some tests to ex exclude this bone marrow failure we were talking about earlier on the call, and also to exclude some of the other congenital platelet problems that can cause low platelets and mimic ITP. But if he's responded to steroids or immunoglobulin in the past, um, then that gives you a lot more confidence that it's ITP and it's just finding then the right treatment that's going to reset his immune system. Yeah, I mean, uh, he responded before, like two years ago, for um, very quick for steroids and for IVIG. But from March this year, recently, it's not responsible for anything. It's like body get used to it for everything what they um, giving to him. Yeah. No, so, I think you know, that's obviously reassuring he did respond to things in the past, but that sometimes can be how ITP can evolve over the years that um, start to become less responsive to treatments. He's like, you know, he just, I don't understand really, like one week is 18 and then it dropped for two. So this is for me, it's like up and down, but thank you. Uh, hopefully it's going to work, you know, after six weeks, like you said. Yeah, you know, pray, <laughs> have your fingers crossed, um, but yeah. do just give it patience. And then if he's not come up after sort of six weeks, that's the time when just to rethink, does he really need treatment again? Or if he does, just to discuss with your haematologist whether you would want to consider splenectomy or whether you'd want to explore some of the other what we call clinical trials, which is early access to some of the new yeah. treatments. Yeah. Yeah, they say already that the great Ormond uh, in the London hospital, there they will be have some trail, new yeah. medi medication for him. Yeah, I've put in okay. the chat the name of that yeah. drug. Um, okay, thank you. And the Luna 3 is the name of the study. And if I was wanting to put him on a study for something, that would be what I would think would probably be the ideal one for him to try. I think this is centre in London and then we're set up in Manchester for it. OK, thank you very much, Marta. And just very quickly, um, I've, I've got three more questions already sent in. John, if, if, if we don't have time, so I'm conscious of the time, uh, you've got copies of them. You know, could you just give us some feedback and send it to me and then I'll uh, send it on to the people who sent them in? That'd be okay. Yeah, I, I might struggle this week to get them back, but I do promise, yeah, as yeah. always, I will get to them. Thank you um, very much. Right. So, okay. by the close up at the end of next yeah, week. Yeah, because yeah. uh, I'm just conscious of time. Rachel, you've got your hand up. Hello, can you hear me? We can, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, lovely. Um, hi. Um, my daughter is six and a half. Um, she was diagnosed four years ago in May 2018. Um, when she was first diagnosed, her platelet count was at 19. Um, and she had regular testing, um, I would say for the following 18 months and her platelet sat between, um, 30 and 50. Um, they did go as high as a hundred, but soon came back down. Um, she's constantly covered in bruises, pin pick, 
crash, constantly tired, but doesn't have, or she has very little bleeding. Um, she never had any treatment. So we've always been told to just watch and wait. So my first question is, what am I waiting for? Um, my second question is, she had a COVID jab at, in August. Um, and previous to that, I would say her platelet count, not knowing because she hadn't been tested, um, I would say her platelet count was pretty good because she had very of the little bruising. Following the COVID jab, um, she was she quickly got covered in the dark bruising, um, then started having nosebleeds at night. Um, so we've got open, open access to the children's ward in the local hospital. Um, but I haven't got her tested, uh, haven't got her platelet count tested um, because I know it's low um, and it distresses her so much. So should I be getting her tested? Um, and it is that reaction from because of the COVID jab is my first word, is the question. And I've had a letter home today for her flu jab. Um, should, she, should I go ahead and give her that based on how she's reacted from her COVID jab? And then my last question is, um, my youngest son, who's four, um, he displays bruising. Um, is it hereditary? I got him tested when he was six months old and his platelet count was absolutely fine. Um, he's now four and a half. Um, are there any links with siblings and should I now be getting him tested? Okay, let's deal with that last one first because that's probably okay. the easiest. So, it hereditary ITP generally isn't something that we do tend to see. Um, right. Okay. I have had a, a few, a couple of families where somebody's had ITP in the past. Um, obviously, I, I would say you know I've got a six-year-old of, of my own who I've never dared do a blood count on, but yeah, she has as many bruises as some of my children who come in with ITP and I think any five-year-old who doesn't have bruises um there's something abnormal going on yeah, there yeah. so and, you know, and if they were just bruises issue. like on the lower legs and things but he tends yeah. to have them like on his spine and the abnormal places where I tend to see them on my daughter yeah the spine's quite a common one in children sometimes right, okay. where they've been sitting on a high a hard chair or especially supermarket trolleys but if you've got a hard wooden feeding chair, it's quite easy. It could get big bruises on the back from there. If we're getting big lumpy bruises that you must be seeing with your daughter or the pinprick yeah. rash, then I then I would get checked. But assuming it's just sort of the typical 10 pence piece softish bruise that comes and goes within a couple of weeks, during which time he then probably picks up a few others, um, then then I wouldn't be worried ab about that. Um, so I think that that's that's the easiest one to answer. Um, your okay, second you. question around COVID. So we offered our families with ITP the, the option to come up and have a blood check done about a week after the COVID vaccine, because I think it's, it's quite well described that the COVID vaccine can cause a temporary drift down in the plate that's whether that's truly any different to any other vaccine, I'm not that much convinced about because we've never really done that with any of the other vaccines. But certainly all of the drops that we observed, I think the longest one we saw was about four weeks and then it sort of returned towards normal. Um, again, in the registry, we did an al analysis of all of the ITPs that were related to vaccination and the vast majority of them, although they cause drops in the plate, that's as much with anybody else who presented with ITP outside of a recent vaccination, they, they were much more likely to be short lived. Although in our in the our analysis, which I think included there was about 200 who were within four weeks of a vaccine, um, there was one or two who went on to have a longer course of ITP. So. I think any vaccine can has the potential, especially live vaccines, of triggering ITP and can cause a temporary drift in the count. And then it's a way up of the pros and the cons of that vaccine. 
um, and the needs of the child, the needs of the family. Um, so obviously if there's people who have other vulnerable illnesses in the family, then you're going to be more inclined to recommend having another COVID jab. Um, but obviously if there isn't, given your previous experience, it's probably wouldn't want to go ahead and give another sort of COVID jab at the moment until the ITP settles down. And I think the same would be for the true of this sort of flu jab. If there is sort of asthma or other sort of lung or heart problems within the family, then you're more likely to want to go ahead with the vaccine. But if there isn't, then not likely to come to much harm from getting the flu, although obviously actually getting the flu or getting COVID can equally drop the plate that's themselves as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just weighing up all of those things. Um, as to sort of managing sort of your daughter, yeah, you know, clearly from what you described, the platelets are going to be below 20 if she's getting lumpy, hard bruises and widespread pinprick rash. Um, you sometimes can see little isolated patch of pinprick. So again, one of my rules is if you can hide the pinprick rash with sort of two hands, then ignore it. But if it's widespread, then it usually indicates the levels are below 10 to 20. Um, and if it's been going on for, you know, over six months, I would say, yes, the same as you, what are you waiting for? Um, the chance of it spontaneously getting better it is less. And then it, it's a case of weighing up the pros and cons of a treatment. So either taking a medicine every day, possibly with dietary <laughs> restrictions with l pag or possibly a, a little injection once a week. Um, and a, a need for more frequent blood monitoring with any treatment, because again, we've got to tighten the dose of the drug to the platelets. And some of the very rare side effect can be a little bit of liver impairments as sometimes it can just inflame the liver. So the liver tests need to be monitored. <laughs> Um, certainly in the early treatment. Um, so with any treatment, I'm afraid there is often to begin with, while you find the right dose, you know, more blood tests that are done there, which I say you just got to weigh up the pros and the cons. So, okay, yeah, Rachel? That's, that's, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Last one. Marie, you got your hand up. Hi, uh, um, Mervyn, you do already have a couple of my questions, which I know you've just mentioned. Well, uh, John can obviously respond to those at a later date. That's fine. Yeah. Um, just an interesting point. Um, I think it was Rachel that just mentioned about the COVID vaccine. Uh, we, looking back at when um, our daughter was first diagnosed, it was shortly after she'd had um, the flu nasal spray at school. Now, she's got that coming up again in a couple of weeks, and we've been told to, you know, to go ahead and have that done, um, which we have booked her in for. I just wanted to, to run that past you. And also, we, at this point in time, have made the decision not to go ahead with the COVID vaccine for her. Um, it was myself that you mentioned earlier that when she had the, when she did actually have COVID, her platelet shot shot through the roof um so we're just a bit uncertain we don't obviously we want to do the right thing um but it's just uh, obviously that question around the covid vaccine and the flu vaccine um as to your thoughts on that that wasn't the reason i put my hand up it, it just came up <laughs> yeah, okay. i should mention that <laughs> okay yeah the the first episode when the counts dropped after the flu vaccine, was that within four weeks, really, of the flu vaccine? Yeah, we didn't know. Uh, she, ironically, she went to have a blood test for something else. She'd been having some difficulty swallowing going back to March 2020. Um, but we couldn't get a scene because of COVID. So once she was able to see a doctor about the swallowing thing, um, they ran some blood tests and it was then that they found that her platelets were around the 70s and that tied in in a short space of time of her having the flu vaccine so we we have no idea what originally caused the itp but it was i would probably say within a month or two of the vaccine the the nasal spray sorry 
Yeah, obviously the timing is quite difficult there if it was just an incidental blood test, so it's hard to work out. Yeah, so we don't know um, how some of the platelets were low for originally. Uh, I mean, when they came back in the October, they were in the 70s, so I appreciate that's not low in, you know, relation to some, some people's situations and as to what, what our daughters have been more recently. But we feel that might have been the start of it because she's never since then, apart from having COVID and having a sickness bug, been anywhere near that number. So, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah. Uh, and so what, um, roughly what count is she running at at the moment? The last one she had a couple of weeks ago was at 28. Okay, okay. Yeah, it, 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 it's a tricky one. You know, as we are saying earlier, you know, any vaccination can drop the counts. Um, the flu vaccine, the one up the nose is a live virus compared to the old flu vaccine that we used to get in the arm, which is killed off and the, the live viruses are more likely to drop it. Um, and similarly, the, the COVID vaccine, which the children get tends to be sort of the Pfizer one. Um, and we, you know, certainly again, that can cause a temporary drop there. Um, and I think it goes back to what we were just discussing sort of earlier. I think you just got to weigh up the pros and the cons of what your family situation is. And if there isn't people who are at high risk, you know, COVID illness in the children tends to be much milder. We do occasionally see some what we call multi, you know, inflammatory responses, but there's no suggestion that people with ITP are more at risk of that. So... I'm, I'm afraid I don't have a hard and fast rule that should or shouldn't. I think it's just a case of weighing everything up. If there was yeah. a more clear temporal association between having the flu vaccine and the counts initially dropping off, um, then I probably would be more wary of going ahead and giving that, that flu jab. Um, I mean, in fairness, um, she did have it last year because we were advised to to do so um and it didn't really impact her, her platelet count last year so so if you yeah you know if it went well last year again it it should you would expect it to more likely than not go absolutely fine again this year yeah okay thank you um anyway the reason i actually put my hand up it was just i got <laughs> digressed with uh, rachel's uh, comment there um what are your what's your advice and thoughts with regards to flying? Because we've had mixed um, we've had mixed comments on this, and um, we we were recently told that anything um, any platelets above thirty, she should be fine with with flying. So we subsequently have been away, and yes, she's been fine, but just obviously wanted to get some clarification from yourself on that. Yeah, my bigger worry isn't always necessarily the flying, it's where you are flying to um, and making sure that you have an understanding of how ITP potentially is managed in those countries if there is a sort of bleeding problem whilst you are abroad. So I think that's my bigger concern. Um, some airlines, and Mervyn probably can answer this better than I can because I think a lot of the adult, adults have come across this more. Some airlines do tend to be, I've heard about some airlines saying that they want a plate that counts of over 20 or over 30. Um, again, your chance of actually bleeding when you're in an airplane seat is no different than when you sat on a sofa at home watching the telly. There's no effects of, you know, air pressures or anything else increasing your bleed. It's just if there is a bleed when you're up in the air, especially with a long distance flight, then they may have to divert the plane. And that's obviously what they get very worried about doing. But certainly for short haul flights, we tend to consider those as being fairly safe. I, I tend to always think about a plate the count of over 30 as being pretty safe. And I generally don't put many restrictions there. I generally try and encourage our families who have a lower plate that count or ones who are less responsive to treatments. I try to encourage, you know, travel more to mainland Europe um, and mainland developed Europe where you can get good treatment if there is a bleeding event. Um, 
I have a couple of families, one who I think is quite active in the ITP support, who literally every consult is a back and forth about where they're going to book their next trip for. Um, I'm referring to Sue here, Mervyn, who you may recall on a few of our meetings. Um, yes. But uh, yes, she's literally sort of rotates between Dubai, somewhere in the Maldives and more recently Mexico in a and yes there's a lot of discussion I think that that we have over there but yeah I, more of my worry is where you go into and make sure that there is decent health care make sure you've de you know declared the ITP on any insurance documents and make sure you have got the insurance there um and then the only other time where I tend to be a little bit more concerned is in when the child has just recently been diagnosed because you don't know whether that child is going to be more likely to have bleeding problems compared to a child who you've had sort of, you know, six months experience with and know that they're really not one who's particularly prone to bleeding. Mm. Yeah, I mean, she she initially had more bleeding. She's, she's coming up two years in, well next month um, from diagnosis and she initially had more bleeding in the first year or so and it was just nose well when I said just nosebleeds there was some quite significant nosebleeds um, but with regards to the flying it's interesting what you said actually because we were initially told that the there were risks with the cabin pressure in the head with uh, no that's reassuring then. Um, but we we obviously made sure we had the insurance, the relative, you know, relevant insurance in place. And we were also advised we always keep the tranexamic acid with us. And we took that and obviously got that on the on the plane with us in case there were any incidents with her nose. But thankfully that was that was all okay. But um that's reassuring what you've said about the pressure because that we also was have um uh, letters describing what ITP is in various languages as well. So, if you ever yes. going abroad, you know, going to Spain, Portugal, Germany, Italy, you know, we've got them in the various languages. You know, that are available. Just email us and we'll send you one. So, Perfect. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I think just to pick up on the point about the tranexamic acid, I think tranexamic acid is a very overlooked treatment in ITP. It's really good for mucosal bleeding. So when you've got that sort of slightly annoying bleed that's not bad enough where you really have to disrupt your ho your holiday and go to a hospital and you want to have the opportunity of managing it yourself at home a little bit tranexamic acid is brilliant in that situation um it generally takes 24 hours to be working at its best but it does have some activity after sort of one or two hours um so i think it's it's a great drug um for some of our children that, who have been going on holiday for a week I've sometimes said just take it for the course of the week um, it sometimes reduces a bit of the bruises um, and when they're going to be throwing themselves around in the swimming pool and you're trying to relax you don't want to be spending all of your holiday trying to answer the question where those bruises come from as well yeah. so it sometimes settles them down a little bit. I mean, in fairness, the she was originally prescribed the tranexamic acid um, orally um, for, for some time, and they decided, you know, would see how she went without that. When she came off it, which what she's been okay, um, not really had any bleeds. She does get bruises and the um, the prickly rash sometimes when we know that her platelets are a little bit lower. But we have been advised with the tranexamic that if she's having a bleed, that we can just put some on, on some gauze just to, to prevent the bleed from the nose. Yeah, it, it has some local activity. It's not brilliant. The, the problem tends to be that the, if you have liquid tranexamic acid, it goes out of date within a couple of weeks. Uh, so you always tend to run out of the, yeah, we've got the liquid when you actually need it. Yeah. Um, yeah. For a kid with a wobbly tooth who I'm seeing in clinic, again, we might adapt that approach. I, I don't like the children being on the tranexamic acid for a long, continuous period. Um, one, it can cause a bit of tummy upset. Mm -hmm. In the adults, we always worry a little bit that it actually potentially can cause blood clots. And actually, adults with ITP are more at risk of blood clots um, compared to the general public, e even with low platelet counts. Um, and in the occasional adolescent 
um, especially if, if on pill or something else complicating that can increase risk of blood clots as well is theoretical concern there, although I've never really seen problems with tranexamic acid. Okay. Yeah, she was only on it for, for a short space of time and she was prescribed, I forget what it was called now, something to avoid the any problems with her tummy. Okay, it was probably a meprazole or an antiacid, but that would be more to prevent problems from steroids rather than the tranexamic acid. Okay. 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 Thank you um, very much, Marie. Thank you. Thank you. I know we're running short of time. I think yeah. we've, there's been a few discussions about older girls, and I know there was a question from Lindsay around periods and things. I wasn't sure whether it's just worth okay. while just spending. Uh, that was from uh, Marie, that was. Yeah. Did you want to touch on that, John, before we go? Yeah. I think it may just be worth touching on. Yeah. Uh, I think firstly what I would say is usually with a plate that count of over 30 the periods aren't I haven't come across the periods generally being a problem obviously any young girl when they first start the first three months can be a little bit erratic sometimes heavier than not again with any girl who's approaching that age or the family the seeing the hormonal changes would certainly make sure they've got the tranexamic acid at home um, and in most girls the tranexamic acid on its own is usually enough to switch it off. Um, occasionally I've come across sort of a sort of 14, 15 year old girl who's just been diagnosed with ITP. Um, and again, we will sometimes give the family at home some norfistrone, which is quite a strong hormone that will use this switch off the period um, just to be a have at home in case it's needed. Um, and then if the period is heavy, then they can always phone in and speak to the to our team, and then we can advise how often to take the norethisterone and what sort of dose to use. Um, and then, if, if problems still ongoing, then it's a case of either considering something like the mini pill or considering treatment to push the plate that's over that thirty mark. When then bleeding shouldn't be a problem. Um, in the early days when we were first using these Eltron, Papagan and Remitlistim, the most common group that we were treating was probably the teenage girls because of that regular bleeding. Um, so, you know, I think those agents are really good to push up the plate that's and stop bleeding problems. And as I say, it's just a weighing up whether you try the hormonal approach or tried getting the plate that's up to switch it off. And I think that's very much an individual child, individual family dis decision there. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone for taking part. Um, just a, a couple of quick things. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, uh, you may or may not have already taken part in our ITP patient perception survey, but if you haven't, uh, it's on our website, it's also on our social media. If you could just take part in that, it will take you about five minutes. Uh, and the information from that will go to help us plan uh, what the association does in the year ahead and also plan what materials we need to produce. We've also just um, published this week, we've launched it this week, uh, an ITP discussion guide that we did in combination with the ITP forum and the ITP support association, co-created by a company called Sobi. That's on our website that you can download. It's, it's a little questionnaire that you can fill in before you go to your consultant's appointment and it will help you actually guide you through what questions to ask your consultant when you're actually there. So it's just a two page thing, you can download it. But we're also getting some printed copies of that done, hopefully in the next couple of weeks they'll be with us. But thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, John, for taking the time and saving the day. You know, uh, thanks to the airline with Nikki, but you know, thank you very much. And if you could just stay on for two minutes, John, I've just got a question to ask you before, no, you, before you go. Okay. But, uh, thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. See thank you again you. soon. Thanks, all.